Hey guys, welcome to the Go Solo Show and welcome back to season two. Now, on this week's show, it's all about starting, running and growing a fitness business. And today I'm excited to say that we have three amazing people who have built a successful winning business with thriving communities, regular customers and amazing social media presence. It's a really international affair as usual on the Go Solo Show today. So today I'm delighted to welcome Carly from the Urban Athlete in Canada. Carly, great to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Uh, Elise, uh, you're from the US. You run two businesses, I believe. It might even be three. You'll have to tell us today. And that's mm-hmm. Sweat Fixed and Fixed Studios. Welcome to the show. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. And Dan, you're based in the UK and you're from the Dan Roberts Group. Uh, welcome to the show as well. Thanks, Johnny. Pleasure to be here. Brilliant. And uh, like I said, a really great combination of guests and obviously for all our regular kind of like audio and visual uh, viewers, we're kind of like here recording this and uh, this is episode three of season two. So let's go on with the show. Now, we all start off on this show by discussing everybody's background and trying to get a real idea about who you are and getting to know you and your motivation to start your business. So I'm going to start off with this first question. And this is maybe let's start with Elise. Maybe you could kind of come in here. So in a nutshell, what is your business? What is it you do? And what is it that sets you apart from all the competition? At least over to you. Yeah, so five years ago, I opened the first Sweat Fix. So Sweat Fix is a rowing and strength studio um, that combines both of those modalities and a workout that anybody can do. Our goal is to create a community that anybody, regardless of your age, sex, fitness level, you can come in, lift heavy, row hard, and walk out feeling like a boss. Within two and a half years, we grew out we grew to five locations and then this year we actually opened a recovery studio called fixed which is all about 20 minute quick efficient um, recovery services such as dry needling grass in foam rolling assisted stretching um, and cupping and we have those six locations now and we're just loving it we just wanted to make people as healthy and happy as they can be Amazing. That sounds great to hear. And I love the fixed thing as well. You're kind of owning people's journey all the way through. So amazing. Thanks very much. And how about yourself, Carly? You're obviously based in Calgary, Canada, I believe. Yep, that's right. Um, So I own a fitness studio here. Um, We kind of have everything under one roof. We have just a gym. People can work out on their own with weights and cardio. And we have personal training. And then we also have um, all of our group classes. And we have a wide variety of classes in there, like boxing, yoga, spin classes, strength, hit. Um, So yeah, that's kind of what I do over here. Amazing. Great to have you here. And Dan, yourself, tell us the Dan Roberts group. We've been on your website. We're going to share links to everybody's businesses and Instagrams later, but tell us about your business now. Uh, Well, basically we help people move and think and perform like athletes. Uh, We do this through various ways. We have a personal training team in London. Uh, We do retreats all over the world. We partner with various hotels. We do events and courses. We do all kinds of stuff. The group now is a group of companies. So it's kind of grown since the very humbling days when I was a fitness instructor. But essentially, we just help people get fit and feel like athletes. That's what we do. Amazing. That sounds really good. And, you know, I think this is a great follow up question here, that which we always ask, because, you know, I don't know if all of you guys kind of came out of the womb and went, this is exactly what I want to do with my life. Fitness is it. <laughs> but, you know, what were you doing before this? You know, like, what was it that, say, you know, you were doing before and got you into this? Uh, maybe we could carry on with you, Dan. You could explain how you kind of got into this industry. What were you maybe doing before? I mean, I did actually start pretty young. I mean, I'm in my mid 40s. I started as a sports coach when I was 16, 15, 16, I was a tennis coach. And then I ended up coaching other sports as well. And then I was, I was bumming around in Australia in my early twenties. And um, I saw there was a company offering like to be qualified as a fitness instructor. And I didn't really understand what that was, but I liked the idea of understanding my body a bit more. So I did that course. And that's when I first learned about the world of strength and conditioning and personal training. So yeah, so I've pretty much have been doing that. I mean, it's been 20, 26, 27 years, a, a long time. A long oh, time brilliant. now. Yeah. And, and a similar Love story, it. guys, you know, Elise, Carly, a similar story to that? Or is this a career change after whatever was happening in your previous life? Yeah. So for me, um, I was in corporate finance and accounting. I was at a corporate job and I got a text about a space I was helping running a boot camp in a couple of years prior. And I literally quit my job and in four weeks opened the first sweat fix. Um, okay. I played wow. college basketball. Yeah, so I played college basketball and I ended up blowing up both my ACLs. So I kind of fell in love with the strength and conditioning and like rehabilitation process when I was in college when I had two torn ACLs. 
And I always wanted to do fitness. I always wanted to do my own thing, but I never knew if I would have the guts to do it. So I went down the corporate accounting route. And then one day when I got that text, I looked at my job and I said, it's now or never. I was 27 years old. I quit my job and the first sweat fix was born. Wow, amazing. And four weeks to me sounds like you really were keen to just get out of there. As wow. you, know, you need to heal yourself, really. That's an amazing yeah. story. And again, like you said, with six now open or opening, that's that's incredible, you know, like to really run with your dream and make it happen. Um, yourself, Carly, like in terms of what you've done, like, you know, whereabouts, how did you land on what you're doing right now? Yeah, so before this, I was running a painting company, um, a painting franchise, actually, and it was kind of a company that was based around teaching people how to run a business. So it wasn't something that anyone really does forever. Um, I did it. I started when I was 18. I did that for six years. And then I knew I like I tried to learn as much skills as I could. And I figured I want to run another business, just something a little bit more aligned in my in my passion. And that's how come I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And I love what you're just saying about the word passion as well in there, because I think, you know, you've got to have that passion in terms of if you're creating your own business and really starting and hopefully having some kind of meaning in terms of getting up every day. It kind of leads me on maybe to my next question, actually, which maybe Carly, you could maybe kind of run with this. It's like beyond running your own business, and maybe being the captain of your own ship, controlling what you're doing. You know, like what what's some other motivations as to why you do what you do? Um, you know, like you could be doing anything else on planet Earth with your days. You know, why fitness and why your own business? And you know, what really gives you that spark about the company and business that you know that you run? Yeah, I f- I find it really fulfilling here because I know how important physical exercise is to like people's mental health. Um, so I I honestly think just that alone uh, helps me get up every day and help other people find that like I have yeah so it's mental health taking people on a journey I guess maybe they start from zero to 60 or might be 10 to 60 or whatever do you know what I mean like you really want to kind of help people and, and that's the motivation for you yeah and we have a really great community here so it's super easy to do that here because we have great members and we're not like a huge box gym we're kind of a bit smaller so we get to really um, know the members on a personal level and it's easy to, to come into work when you like everyone here. <laughs> yeah, that sounds amazing. And like anybody can just say, look, I do it for the cash, you know, where you know where we are here, but I'm sure obviously it isn't. This seems like there's deeper stuff at play here. Uh, Dan, Elise, how about your own motivations for, for what it is that just gives you fulfillment in doing what you do? Uh, well, for me, my, mine's evolved. Like when I started coaching, I, I did it because I like the idea of not having a boss and having, you know, I was a personal trainer for many years and I, I love the freedom. And yes, I like, I love people and I like hanging out with people, but as I've got older, it's, and my kind of business has evolved. It's been more about, I guess, in line, what we just heard were about helping people and making a difference as cheesy as it sounds like actually trying to help people and being of use. I think it's so nice to be of use. Um, when you're doing that, your days are fulfilled regardless of your profit margins, you know? Yeah, of course. And like in terms of um, you starting out of this, you know, like you said, the business has evolved. We're going to get oh, deeper yeah. later by on. Accident. In terms of, I was going to say, was it by accident? <laughs> it wasn't by design. Is it more about opportunities come up? You you could go left uh, or right or whatever. I mean, I, I'm not a business person, so I find it really odd that I run a few companies now. I just it just things naturally kind of happened. I think yeah. what happens it's just like athletes when you reach one goal, like my big goal is to train certain types of people and, and to charge a certain amount. And when I reached those goals, it was like, well, what next? And it was like, okay, well now I'll have a gym. Now I'll do this. And so it was more kind of just natural progression. That's why I've maybe progressed probably slower than these two ladies, because I've just done things when I've got bored and naturally gone up. There wasn't, a, I'd never had a business plan. It just kind of just naturally evolved and yeah. things have gone. And I've been lucky, I think. I think it's, a, you know, what you're saying, you know, like I, I was just saying off air to everybody but earlier, you know, this is about the 25th episode we've recorded of this and everybody has similar stories, but I think, you know, it, it's a bit of luck, it's, but it's also putting yourself out there as well and making those opportunities happen. Like if you just sit at home and don't make things happen for yourself, then it's probably never going to do. That's true. But I think that's down to a lot to your personality type as well. You know what yeah. I mean? If you're, how, how risk of it, if you hate risk, you're not really going to do well in any business in any industry but if you quite like risk and you get bored easily you like a challenge the skills you can learn you'll probably do quite well I think 
this is true this is true and how about yourself Elise like uh, yeah those deeper motivations is it just because you're now on that journey and it's like you've managed to prove in four weeks that this was the right decision for you and that you know you're you're in a real growth stage like what's that motivation for you yeah so similar to Dan I feel like it's kind of evolved so at the beginning um, I just wanted to be my own boss and I wanted to do something that lights me up and I was an athlete my whole life And as soon as basketball ended, I needed something competitive and athletic to kind of throw myself into and fitness was it. And owning this studio, I wanted to give people that same feeling like they can feel like an athlete again, regardless of whoever they are. Um, So that's definitely how it started. And it it involved into this huge community aspect that I can't imagine now not having in my life. And I can't imagine not being connected to these people. Um, We can talk about it later, but I've had some serious life events happen while I was growing these businesses from losing a baby when I was six months pregnant to my mom passing away. A lot of things getting diagnosed with an incurable kidney disease. Um, And without having this community that we built, I don't know how I ever would have got through it. So for me, my, my why, my reason, my mission statement has definitely changed. And at the beginning, it was like, just be your own boss, get competitive. Now it's more yeah, just it's all community. It's all community for me. And I think that being genuine, that's helped it grow um, as quickly as it did. Yeah. And that sounds amazing. And look, I think it's like you say, you know, maybe you're finding your reason to exist through this all. You know, you've weathered the storms of personal things that have come on. But this is, you know, you found your right fit. The reason you were put on planet Earth community is so strong. I mean, you know, every business now who wants to be successful, really you know, like has to have a community or maybe they don't have to have a community, but it really helps them in terms of marketing their business. But in terms, I think, of being genuine and getting something that's real and getting cut through, you know, like beyond obviously just spending on advertising, it kind of leads well into this next question. And, you know, I I hate to bring up this word. I wasn't going to mention the P word, but we always ask it. But how did the pandemic affect your businesses? And Look, we, I think we know communities helped a lot of businesses pull through, which is great. You know, strong community has really helped. You know, like I said, I've chat with a lot of entrepreneurs on and off the show. But, you know, how did the pandemic affect you? You know, what was your pandemic experience like? And where where's that left the business? And, you know, I hate to use the word opportunities because we don't want to use that. It's been a very tough year and a half. But, you know, like what, what's it opened in terms of your business that maybe you weren't doing before that? I'm just going to throw that question in there. Feel free to, to grab hold of it, someone. Yeah, I mean, I can start. So for us, the very next day that we got closed down in the US, we started virtually live streaming classes and we started like a 34 class a week live schedule. Um, I think that the pandemic, at least for us, showed us where we have holes in our business and where we could grow. Um, So now, even though we're fully open in all our five studios, we still have our live streaming platform um, that people still take from home, whether it's a row class or a strength class. We do a lot more fitness programming, like just personal training programming via online now, which we never did before. Mm. We built out our on-demand platform. So I think it just forced us to be better. I mean, obviously we would never want this to happen, but it forced us to evolve. Um, And so a lot of those things are part of our business and they're not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Luckily, we had a great community because our platform isn't as nice as the Peloton. It's not as shiny and like whatever. It's not as clean cut. But what you do get, and I'm sure they can speak to this too, is you get our instructors, our community, our faces. And that's why I think people have stuck with us because they want to see their local instructors. Um, And so for us, we were able to hold on to some members and they've supported us throughout it. um, And we've definitely gotten better on the virtual side, which we were lacking before. And that's now here to stay there, the virtual side. Do you think that's an extra kind of growth function of your business? It's like an extra part of the business that's going to keep going from strength to strength yeah definitely so for us we still see we see a lot of numbers still virtually whether it's through our replays or we have some classes where you can book it and then right after class you'll get the replay for 24 hours um so a lot of people even if they can't take it at that exact time they book that class and then the next day they'll take it before it expires um so stuff like that we have people that bought rowers and they still jump onto our, so we stream out of the studio and they'll jump onto the rowers and actually street row along with the class. So stuff like that, that once we, we built the setup and got the mixers and everything in place, um, yeah. it doesn't add any extra cost for us. So it's something we're definitely gonna continue. Brilliant. It, it's such a strange like time we're living through. We actually are living through the future right now. It, obviously, I hope that makes sense. 
you know, in terms of there's so much change happening, like, you know, even technology, you know, like, I don't know if we'll see a point in a few years time where people will be wearing Oculus Rift style VR headsets and doing it because like you said, they've had the equipment at home, but they still want community. They want the instructors. They want to be part of it. They want this virtual world. You know, we're living through this right now. And, you know, if anything, everybody's getting broadband extensions everybody's kind of investing in new tech businesses are having to pivot and think about that or even opening up real life and that virtual sense uh dan carly similar stories to the pandemic uh i'm really interested to hear what yours was like to you carly <laughs> yeah well there's actually a lot of similarities between what elise said and what and what we did we also switched over to virtual the day after like we were open and then here's our virtual classes and we haven't stopped since. Um, so, so that created a, uh, a, a new business that we didn't think, ever think of before the pandemic. Um, and it helped us keep our members engaged. I think um, something else that really helped us is we actually took this business over from the previous owners who started it up. And I think because of the pandemic, we didn't feel so much imposter syndrome. We felt more like we had ownership of it because we started up the virtual program. We held on to the members and we kind of like rode through the roller coaster of the last year and a half. Um, so, yeah, it gave us a little bit more, um, I guess, pride in in being here and, help, and making sure Urban Athlete is still standing. Of course. And I mean, like, you know, heads off, you know, sorry, hats off to you all for actually being able to kind of like, you know, do this because I'm chatting with a lot of people, it was slight blind panic to start off with and like, right, what do we kind of do now? And I know, Dan, your story is quite personal, I think, in terms of the pandemic. And don't worry, there won't be any more questions of the pandemic after, uh, you know, <laughs> after this one, I think we're all wanting to see the back of it. Well, it's an, it's an interesting one, the pandemic. I mean, I, I totally hear what we've just been heard. I mean, I think one thing we have to remember is that because of technology and advancement, now every trainer can have Zoom, every studio can have like live classes. So I think the importance of brand is more important than ever. You can't just yeah. use technology like 10 years ago, whoever had the best technology would kind of win in this space. Now we all have access to relatively cheaply to build membership sites, live streaming, email lists. It's all pretty cheap really compared to what it used to be. So now we have to really focus on really serving our community, having a personality, being clear what we stand for, uh, and I think the companies which have done well in the pandemic haven't just, I mean, everyone does live streaming, but the ones who've done well have been really clear about why they're doing it. And they're really, you can see they're being genuine and they're yeah. really helping. They're not just going, shit, when you do a live, because if you just do a class and you don't think about it, no yeah. one's going to come back to it. Yeah, you have to really, sh you know, show your passion. So I'm sure that's why these girls have done really well, because they're clearly passionate and they're, you know, they're transferring what they normally do day to day into the online rather than starting from scratch trying to get an online business without which is really hard I think of course and I, and I think as well you know like final question on the pandemic how did you all feel like in terms of you know what once you know, I think when it first started you know let's cast it back 18 months I think everybody was a bit like oh I may not be as bad as China whatever you know this might happen and all of a sudden things did change quite quickly overnight in all of our countries you know was it a case of being quite stoic and thinking right now is the time to plan was there an extreme stress for a few days and thought, right, how am I going to figure this out? Was it get paper and pen out and start mapping? Or did you just roll up your sleeves and think now is the time to get on with this virtual offering? I'm just really interested to know how you kind of coped with that, because I think for a lot of people, you know, people are quite happy in their in their growth stage of knowing which way the wind is blowing all the time. You know, they know uh, what the rules are in terms of life. The pandemic ripped up the whole rule book. It's interesting to know how you approach that, knowing that you were going to have to change up your business model quite a lot. I guess I'll go first. I mean, for me, it, um, it wasn't that hard because I've been in much worse situations. <laughs> and, right. um, and it's, you know, I've started from, I've, I've worked as a trainer in five different countries way before social media, having to start from scratch. And when you and I've had no kind of financial support. So when you rock up in a new city, New York or L.A., Sydney, wherever I am, and have to build a business from scratch, you have to be creative with your business models. You have to learn how to sell. You have to learn how to market. So because I've done that so many times and because I've done it for a long time, the actual pandemic didn't it didn't stress me out in terms of the, the business side of things. 
I was, you know, not very happy because of the pandemic, but, um, and I run a few businesses. For example, one of my businesses is a retreat business where we go up to the Maldives and obviously that business tanked, but I have other yeah. businesses. So, yeah. so I was like, yeah. And as I've got older, I don't really get too excited by good things happening in my business. And I don't really get too sad about bad things. I kind of get, I'm kind of a bit, try to be a bit more Zen about it because I think tends to work out well. And as long as I kind of do my best and try and be nice to people, things tend to work out okay. So that's, so yeah, that, that's need, how I approached it. I, I need a glass of what you're drinking, man. I, I, when, I was, <laughs> when, I, when I was still, when I was, there you go. Yeah. Pure <laughs> vodka all the way through the day, like Mads Mikkelsen. <laughs> I was a, uh, yeah. Cause I was stalking you on, on Instagram, obviously like the other day and I was seeing you. You were saying about, you know, it's always good to do my research about our guests. And yeah. I know obviously you were saying, you know, meditation for yourself, you haven't been doing loads of recently, but in no. terms of, you know, you seem to have a good balance there about being quite stoic in the face of potential changes. But then maybe well, that sto- comes stoicism to- is easy when you've dealt with stuff before. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, you know, be it personal stuff in your life or other business things. Every time you go through something which is a bit shit and you go through it, yeah. you grow and you realize, oh, I can handle that. So if you run a business for 10 years and you have a month of bad cash flow, you don't panic. Where if you've just set up a business and you have a negative month, you might, yeah. you know, run around like a headless chicken. But once you've gone on a bit, you realise, hey, it's just, you know, a learning experience. So I think it's easy to be chilled the kind of longer you go on. Yeah. And for the rest of you guys, a learning experience, you think, you know, you a few days and then it was like back to it. Or I'm just just to know, like how you first approached it. What was your kind of emotions about the whole thing? I mean, for us, I feel like it was just immediate messy action. Um, we obviously didn't think it was going to be as long as it was. So it was like, oh, it's going to be two weeks. We're going to take messy action. We're going to throw all this shit against the wall and see what sticks. Basically, like we just wanted to see what was going to happen. Um, and then it just kept going and going. Um, but so I feel like we didn't have enough time to panic. We're like, we just need to make it happen and get it done. So our mindset wasn't like, oh, crap. Our mindset was our classes. We can transfer them virtually. Our members are awesome. They're going to stick with us. We're going to provide the best service we can with what we have yeah. and, and just see what happens. So Brilliant. And throwing shit to the wall seems to have worked actually, which is yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but it's true. I mean, look, having that right attitude, Carly yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think every time there's an announcement co- that comes out, it's, it's stressful. Um, but as long as you keep keep working then you can figure out a solution um yeah the first like the first time when we ran our virtual classes um like lee said it wasn't probably wasn't very good but uh the longer it went on then we okay let's get a better webcam because this is still going on let's get a better mic system and you know just keep refining it and yeah it's funny to look back and think wow i can't believe we did that but and now it's so much better but (laughs) yeah it's true everybody seems to have much better production levels much like you said much higher (laughs) resolution much whatever it's it's quite incredible dan's laughing here (laughs) yeah yeah. all you know my cafe audience is new i never had any of this stuff like two years ago fancy webcam big screen it's, it's hilarious i know we really are in this kind of like now it's like you know you but i think you know like i said technology is evolving you know like we're all you know hopefully improving as well so this kind of falls on to my final question really which is part of uh, part one and you know we've just discussed the pandemic we've just discussed kind of like your motivations and why you do what you love um but bottom line is you know how how do you also get the balance from being an entrepreneur and also having a great work-life balance? You know, the way I cut it is I don't expect you to have a nine to five. I know fitness, you know, has a lot of endorphins that are released, makes you feel good, you know, makes you feel good. You talked about community, but, but how do you guys achieve a work-life balance? You know, like, do you, do you feel stressed out? Do you, how do you say no? Are you happy to work long hours? I'm just interested to know how you do that because you know, like we were chatting with a Pilates instructor on this show recently. And I'm like, so I imagine you have great work-life balance. You know, you do Pilates and yoga 20 times a week. And she's like, well, there was a point when I realized I was teaching 60 classes a week and it was just massively out of kilter in terms of that. And I need to do other stuff. So I'm interested in what your own approaches are to work-life balance um, in terms of doing that. And, and again, how you cope with stress as a general entrepreneur as well. I guess I'll start. So I feel like work-life balance at the beginning, there was no such thing. When you first opened your business, and especially as quickly as I did, it was it was all the time. Um, even when you weren't working, though, your brain's still on and you're still thinking about it. 
Um, and that's kind of true to now. I feel like my brain kind of never shuts off. Um, recently though, I just had a baby six months ago. So now my work-life balance has to be, it has to be more, uh, balanced because obviously he's most important, the new baby. So yeah. it definitely has shifted, but in the early stages, I feel like you're all in, at least I was all in, you're grinding, you're getting this thing running. And then hopefully you set up processes in place so that you can have that work-life balance. So now I can only teach five classes a week out of the five locations um, and spend all this time with my son. So for me, spending time with my son, obviously working out, um, that's how I find my balance. Yeah, brilliant. That sounds great. It sounds like you have got a good balance there. It sounds like you've got quite strict boundaries in terms of what you're willing to do now in terms of your own time. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely in the beginning I feel like I had no boundaries I would teach as many classes as I could and but now it's there's boundaries and um, there's something that takes priority amazing beyond the vodka Dan like you know what what, what kind it's, of gets it's you funny. <laughs> well I um I've, I've been the opposite of Elise which is not good because that, that's mm -hmm. a more sensible approach but um for me my because I've been a trainer for a very long time right so my 20s I wasn't particularly ambitious I, I saw it was more of like a lifestyle job so I'd only work like four or five hours a day, five days a week. And I used to travel a lot. And it was just basically a, a lifestyle business. So I was, there was no stress at all. But then when I hit my 30s and I started getting, uh, I guess, more successful and more of a reputation, a good reputation, that's when I became more ambitious. And that's, um, and that's kind of carried on. So now I work, I work crazy hours. And I, I don't have much life balance at all now because I'm at this point in my life, I'm at the, the most ambitious I've ever been. And also, I don't have I don't have kids. Uh, my my wife, with her job, she's a bit of a workaholic too. So it actually works well because she works really long hours, and I work long hours, and we're kind of happy like that. There's no kind of tension. Yeah. So um, so at the moment, I don't have much balance. Um, I but one thing I do do because I still see private clients. I, I'm very selective of who I work with because it's it's so much uh, takes so much energy. So mm -hmm. I only work with people I really kind of vibe with. Because if I train someone I don't really get on with or click with like five days a week, then it's too draining. So I'm super selective. And that's why it's nice to have a big team, because I can be booked up if there's someone I don't quite gel with. Of course. Um, and but, don't yeah. worry, we won't be sending this podcast out to them after this as well. Oh, so they won't. Like, <laughs> all, 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 <laughs> all of your secret rules are coming out. Uh, you know, it's like, don't tell them that I'm booked up every Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but no, honestly, I mean, I think you're right. But it sounds like you really love what you do, though. It sounds like you enjoy yeah. the work, you enjoy the process, you get a buzz from everything. Oh, God, do. if I was like a billionaire, I wouldn't do anything differently. Like, I, I love, like, I love the balance of seeing a few clients. I like running businesses. I like thinking of business plans and figuring out how to get more clients. And I, I like the kind of little stresses of it, the little problems yeah. you find as a business owner, uh, the opportunities and the problems. And it's basically problem solving yeah. a lot of the time. And I quite like that. So it's, uh, it keeps your brain engaged. You're right. I think, you know, you, we all, I think if you are an entrepreneurial type, I think you need things which stimulate that and actually yeah. need is when you have too much idle time, then you actually start getting bored or you dissatisfied or whatever you need something to constantly hold on to yeah yeah it's good and carly are, are you working 100 hour a week so you are you in there like you know can't wait to get going in the morning what's your approach to work-life balance and keeping it all together yeah i think one of the things i like about business is um that you can have some seasonality to it where if you want to work a long hour or you have to work a long hour i'm totally okay with that and then other times when i'm like oh i don't actually have that much to do this week it's nice because I'm like, well, I put in all those hours last week. Um, so I kind of like the, the different rhythms of business. Um, and then in the times when I feel like I'm working a lot, some things that I do to stay grounded is, is um, like activities that I can be really focused so that I can't think about work, um, like playing an instrument, because then I'm like focused on the sound and the, the sheet music. And I, and it's like, just, I'm too focused. I can't think about work. So it kind of like makes me compartmentalize. Sometimes if I'm sitting at home, like watching TV, I'm, I can still think about work. It's not as a focus as an activity. So yeah, so you need to keep yourself on that. You know, I, I've, I've myself, you know, I was telling everybody um, before off, off air, that, you know, like I, my wife has been trying to get me into fitness. Finally, you know, I've always done lots of yoga over the years, but never really got into it. And I'm, I'm turning 40 next year. And, uh, you know, she's saying weights is great for bone density, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
know, we have a rig in our garage. I've been practicing this, but I've been really finding it enjoyable lifting weights each day or, or every other day, but actually listening to a lot of audible podcasts and books and stuff like that. I just find the right focus level between doing something for an hour or something and then actually, but then actually also getting something out of it. You know, like obviously I'm feeling better for it feeling healthier and feeling stronger, but also being able to focus. I think just having that, like you said, I think TV has got too many distractions. I mean, how many times do we multi-screen now as well? You can never really switch off or I think get into something deeper, unless you maybe go to the cinema and are in a dark room and there's nowhere else really to turn your attention to as well. So cool. I think there's some really great stories there about how you guys got started, like what your motivations are, what keeps you kind of going on a daily basis. Now we're going to move through into some of your growth tips about how you've maybe grown your business or maybe how you've launched new products. I'm really excited to try to get a feel from you guys about how you went and did it yourself. So I'm going to put it out there, Instagram. You know, Instagram is, I think, so important almost as like an extra shop window to you. You know, like, I don't know, the last time people said, oh, look at these people on Facebook or look at people on other platforms. Instagram is such a visual way of attracting people, you know, whether it's your current customers your community, your potential audience, those sorts of people. And obviously it links to your websites as well. You've all built up really impressive Instagrams and you're all doing something a little bit different with it. Um, please don't kill off this question early by saying I just post natural stuff. Uh, but you do all post very natural kind of like real life stuff that you do. I'm just interested to know how you've grown and were there certain tactics you used or even just random things you did that really helped you grow and you went, wow, that's really had a big boost for me because... The entrepreneurs that we have on this show and also entrepreneurs listening now, they're maybe starting an Instagram account fairly low. And, you know, we would like them to get into the thousands and grow it from there. What's maybe some of your tips for, for growing your Instagram accounts? Uh, I'll have a go first. I think the most important thing is be true to yourself. Like, I'm, you know, a, a white guy in his mid 40s. It'd be very odd for me to start doing TikTok dances even if it's popular, because it's because <laughs> that's just weird. You know, I'm not a 22 year old, you know, I mean, it's, it's weird. So I think what I talk about and do things on my account makes sense to someone who looks like me and sounds like me and it feels natural. It's not forced. Yeah. So I, so I don't mind if I make a post or try and be funny, whatever I try and do on there, at least it's me. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter because at least it's still being me. The worst thing to do is try something which isn't you mm. and then, if it works, then you have to pretend to be someone you're not. And if it doesn't work, then, then it's an even bigger waste of time. So yeah. I, I think it's best just to be be yourself. I know it sounds so basic, but... Yeah, I've noticed that. But I think, just like I said earlier, you know, I've had a look at on, on all of your Instagrams and been following for a while. And I think what you're doing, though, is like you'll post a real life photo, but then that will, I think, have a deeper meaning. It feels like there is a real connection, you know, not just kissing your ass here in terms of how you've done it, but I think there you're is a way. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, yeah. But I think it is, well, you know, like I, I look in the photo and you'll post something and then there'll be the deeper meaning is in there and something and there'll be some actionable tips or something. It doesn't feel like, a, hey, it's Monday motivation day. Let's talk about this well, or whatever. For me, I, I'm not trying to be an influencer. I'm not trying yeah. to get more follow. I mean, I regularly de delete people. I'm not trying to get sponsored or anything. So yeah. I, I'm not, I'm coming at it where, and it's not the main source of how I get work either. Yeah. So it's 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 a nice little addition and it's quite freeing. If my business was only getting clients or building, getting sales from Instagram, maybe I'd approach it differently. But I feel quite free on my Instagram that I can just kind of play around with it and just yeah. show people a little bit what I stand for. And that, that's the thing I focus on. Rather than giving too much fitness tips, I try and share like what, what I believe. It's kind of one of my things I I think one of the way our company sort of stands out is that we have a very clear philosophy of fitness and of coaching. So I like people to see that. And yeah. Instagram is one way of people seeing that. Well, let me tack on a question to that one just while you're chatting, Dan, because I think this will be a good one that follows the Instagram for the rest of our guests. Um, you say, obviously, you don't get the majority, obviously, your customers through. I'm just interested to know like other methods you use to market your business. Yours might be slightly different because you said, obviously, you've got numerous businesses and different types of Yeah, clients. we have. Different, exactly. But, but, I mean, you know, like, I guess, I mean, different. I mean, with private, I mean, in London, we specialize mainly in working with actors and models, which is a very niche little world. Yeah. All of that is word of mouth. So we work a lot on, on film sets and studios. So um, it's a, it's a kind of clique little world that. So if you train like a bunch of Hollywood actors and you do a good job, they will all talk to each other and they know who you are. So we get a lot of 
referrals, particularly the Hollywood clients, from agents and from producers and from fellow actors who recommend us. Right. Um, and that's actually, and if we had, if I was posting images of all my clients on Instagram, that would actually harm that side of that business. Yeah, because the course. fact that we're quite low key about it helps us, particularly with the really famous people. Um, uh, also, we're in the press a lot. We do a yeah. lot of stuff in, in the press, uh, particularly in the UK, but also in America. So we're in Shape and People, Wall Street Journal. All that stuff helps in terms and, of building a reputation. You and know? do you naturally go after those, Dan, or do you have a PR like agency or anything? Or is it just like relationships you've built up over time? Uh, relationships we've built. I mean, like I said, I've been doing it for a long time. So yeah. originally I was very strategic. I emailed every journalist I could think of like 20 years ago and I kept on pestering them. Now <laughs> journalists contact us and Brilliant. say, do you, have, do you have anything coming out? Women's yeah. Health did it yesterday. Do you have anything coming out we can talk about? Yeah, yeah right. So that's, that's, it's nice. It gets a lot easier as you go on, but um, you can kind of, we've never had a PR company. You can bypass PR if you're persistent. Yeah, that oh, sounds amazing. That, and to be honest, we share a lot of our top tips from these podcasts on our blog as well. So I'll be taking right. that in terms of persistency. I think as well, having inbound is an amazing situation to be in now because... Like you said, but you have to put the work in. Uh, you have to put the yeah. work in. And also, if a journalist, even now, if a journalist contacts us and they want a quote, I'll give them a quote within six, seven hours. Even if they need it in five days' time, I'll make sure I give it them. And I don't insist on a credit. I don't insist that you write this. I'm like, okay, I just, I really try and help because the more journalists and editors, you, the more of them that they can rely on you, the more times they'll turn to you. And that's why we get a lot of, you know, we get a lot of media attention. Amazing. And, I, right. and I think yeah, that's why. And, and then a lot of eyes on your company as well. So yeah, being consistent and being trusted by journalists. It helps when you're in, when you're in like Wall Street Journal and the Times and the Telegraph and they say you're great, that. It's a bit like, you know, everyone talks about social proof nowadays. I don't have a blue tick. I don't have hundreds of thousands of followers. But because respected magazines and newspapers say nice things about me and my company, yeah. that kind of is our social proof in a way. And it, it means is. I don't have to talk about my private clients, which we don't like talking about. Of course. And having that, like you said, exclusive you know, behind yeah. the scenes access is pretty yeah. much what they're paying yeah. for as well. So amazing. Yeah. That's a great story, Dan. Thanks for sharing it. And uh, maybe I could ask a similar question to you guys, just to remind you, it's, uh, you know, how have you grown your Instagram following and are there other ways that you market your business to get new customers as well? You know, like uh, are there other ways which, you know, you do it offline as well? I guess I'll go next. So for my personal Instagram, similar to Dan, I feel like it's just super important just to be, genuine and be who you are so my Instagram I'm super raw people know the struggles that I've gone through I'm not it's not very fluff it's it's very raw and I feel like that's how I found my people because they follow me they know what they're going to get um at the same time certain posts I try to add value there'll be certain workouts but at the end of the day people just want to follow a story and they want to follow people that they that they think are being true and they their vision aligns with theirs um for sweat fix uh, so Instagram specifically, specifically um, we do a lot of community outreach. We do a lot of collaborations. We do a lot of like mm. fun contests and stuff to just engage people. Um, we're not about shutting other companies out. We love to collaborate with other breweries, other fitness studios, other local businesses. And so I think that helped us grow Sweatfix. Um, and at the beginning, we, we don't spend money on advertising or anything like that. At the, be at the beginning, it was all just word of mouth and Instagram. So we would do Instagram contests at sweat fix. When you came in, if you took a picture with like, I survived my first fix sign and you post it and you tag three friends, just stuff like that just started to snowball. Yeah. Um, and it was all our best clients have been through word of mouth, our friends of friends, or it just, that's the best way I we found to get people in because you're going to trust what your friend says. If they have a good experience, if they're getting good results, then you're going to want to go where they go. Yeah. Um, so we, we haven't put the dollars in and it works for some people, the marketing dollars, but for us, we haven't really done that yet. Um, so that's how we've started to grow. There's some great, uh, creative ideas there as well. I actually wrote a blog on our go solo blog a couple of weeks ago about kind of word of mouth marketing. And, uh, I think the collaboration is really interesting. What you're saying about not just going collaborating with other fitness brands, it's collaborating with other people in your town cities whatever because like you said breweries or whatever you know it doesn't seem like a natural fit but i guess you're bringing their audience over vice versa you know maybe you're serving them you know what's to say if you enjoy beer you can't also enjoy fitness i like both so yeah 
it makes it sense. Obviously, maybe not at the same time. You know, I may end up spilling a bit <laughs> while I'm lifting these weights as well. Uh, Carly, what's your yeah. approach to Instagram and, and also like, you know, where are you getting your customers from primarily? Yeah, so for my personal Instagram, I don't focus on it a lot anymore. I used to kind of focus on growing it and it was kind of just a lot of work. So kind of put that to the wayside and I just post when I want to and I don't focus on on any intention really behind it. And, and then for our business Instagram, um, we just post on it five times a week. We try to, mm. you know, keep, keep people in the loop of things that are happening and the classes and all of that. Um, our, our gym Instagram isn't that huge either, <laughs> but yeah. um, we still do that just, just in case someone's watching out there. Um, and then our other forms of marketing, we're actually on a really good st- good street it's really busy we got a lot of traffic so a lot of our business is like drive by walk by um and then uh referrals or word of mouth yeah amazing and this is what i love about this show as well because there are so many contrarian views here one week it might be like it's all about insta 99.9 percent of it is all about that some people have and every business is different so i think the the main takeaway from this is word of mouth referrals, you know, being genuine online, but also finding out what works for your type of business, you know, like really put the work into thinking what's actually going to be the right strategy for your business. As Dan's saying, if he posts consistently and actually, you know, I put down here, TikTok dancers, you know, we'll know you've run out of ideas, Dan, in a few years time. If I see you do these <laughs> exactly. dancers, yeah, we'll know all businesses are struggling a bit if, if you're kind of resorting <laughs> to that. But I think it's true, you know, like I think this, we're always trying to coach people here about, you know, new ways to think about their business, you know, look at what you've got to experiment, you know, like we're, at the moment, like we're doing a lot of email marketing at the moment where we're doing daily emails. I don't know if it'll work or not, but you've got to try things for like six months and see if it resonates with like your audience and see if you can handle the time doing it and then maybe try YouTube. I think it's the nice thing about running a business is that you can do what you want. You can just play around and see what works because there's many ways of, it's not really the tool. It's like, it's more, more the message behind it, I guess, which is most important, isn't it? Yeah. And also, I guess, having, like you said, an omni-channel approach to it, you know, like trying new stuff, seeing where those different funnels are coming in. How are you going to approach that? I mean, one thing I'd like to add, because I, you know, when I, I mentor a lot of trainers and I do recommend, I do think it's quite dangerous just to rely on just one channel, particularly if you don't own it. Instagram, you know, in two years time, it might be like Facebook was where you have to kind of pay for advertising. And mm. if you have a huge following on there and then it's like, or you get banned from it or you get cancelled you're, you're it's a nightmare so i think the more things you can do to i think email marketing is quite good because at least you own you have the email address of that person and you kind of own that yeah so no one can really take that away from you uh so i think time spent on your brand and your reputation and is always money well spent as opposed to just becoming popular on a particular platform yeah and without knowing a crystal ball but also knowing you know, Mark Zuckerberg's tactics. I think you're probably not too far off in terms it's of... very risky. You know, yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, WhatsApp has got some kind of paywall in the future or something, you know, or, or, or to turn off ads or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Which I'm sure will come down the line in the future. So I think you're right in terms of that, you know, how many people do we it's, know it's who Facebook groups? Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, for those of us which have employees, it, when you're sort of self-employed, you can get away of like having a bad month. When you have like a team and you're paying people's wages you have to be a bit more smart about this because yeah. other people are relying on you as, as a, as a CEO or the managing director. Yeah. So you have to kind of think strategically about, about this stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to get an idea because you're all obviously entrepreneurs and, you know, like we, like I said, we, we welcome all sorts of verticals, different industries onto this show, but I'm interested to know how much of what you do is based on gut feeling and how much of it is done on research in terms of, you know, um, business resources you follow? You know, I do you read regular business books. Are there business influencer entrepreneurs that you follow, you know, Tim Ferriss types or whatever? I'm interested to know, like, what resources that you consume that you maybe would share with other entrepreneurs listening to this show that might help them start, run or grow a successful business, you know, like anything springing to mind that you just go, wow, I, I really do enjoy their podcast, book, website, whatever. Um, so I'll start. So I don't have a ton of books or anything like that, but I can say whenever people ask me what they should start doing, my main thing is you need to just start now. And that means 
getting out there, going to fitness classes, meeting with trainers, trying out different things, networking, building, building your network right now. So that's what I did at the beginning. I would go to all the fitness studios, all the trainers. I wanted to get as much experience as I could to see what I liked, what I didn't like. I would go on Instagram and follow companies across the country and see like, again, what I liked, what I didn't like, what was, wasn't working, I thought for them. And then I got on the phone and I would call owners before I opened Sweat Fix and just ask them if I could have 20 minutes of their time and to pick their brain on if they could do things over, what would they do? So I felt like for me, when I was building out this business plan, and this is before I ever had a space, but it was like, if I ever get a space, I want to be ready. And that's what I tell people now, like, be ready, do your, do the work now, um, is to just connect with people. I mean, I do love certain podcasts, like how I built this, even though it's not fitness related, it's still, yeah. it takes you through their whole story. It gets you inspired on how they started. Um, but I feel like a lot of it is just showing up, mm. whether that's you're trying to open a business or you're just trying to work for a studio. Um, my, one of my pet peeves is like getting an email for somebody that wants to train at Sweatfix to become a trainer, but they've never even taken a class at Sweatfix. So you got to go there. You got to show up. You got to put the time in. you got to get the experience. Um, and I think that that means more than for me, that means more than reading a book. It's like getting out there, talking to people, seeing how they did things. Yeah showing up that is that's something i've written down by the way I, for any viewers i'm not doing the crossword here i always take a lot of notes as well so i can <laughs> remember all of these different things later on so that's amazing like you're saying that showing up as well and also how i built this big fan as well i, I don't know if you guys listen to that podcast but it's a great show you know you can listen to it whenever but it's such inspiring stories from people who've gone and done it themselves from smaller brands to big worldwide companies about how they really got started and how they grew their business um, Carly, how about yourself? Yeah, something that I learned in, in my previous business that I've kind of uh, adopted in this one is having a, like a business advisor, um, just someone with an outside perspective to look at the business in an unbiased way and give give advice or give support and accountability. Um, that's a resource that I think is pretty valuable and I've used in the last business and in this one as well. Yeah. So mentorship, having a strong network, having people you can rely on to ask for advice, maybe people again, who've been there, done it or in a similar kind of field as well. Yeah, exactly. Especially being kind of young in the industry still, I don't, I obviously don't know everything. So I need, I need other people in my arena to help, to help with the, with more knowledge that I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah. And that's great. And I think the beauty of things like mentoring is almost like a pay it forward thing. So in 5, 10, 15 years, you may be mentoring numerous businesses as well, you know, trying to help them on their journey as well. So it is really, really so important as well, you know, that the information and experience you're taking from people that you can then pass it on to the next generation, everything as well. How about yourself, Dan? Like, uh, you've got the full podcast rig now, but like, are you a podcast <laughs> consumer? Do you read lots of books? I'm interested to know what's... Yeah, uh, I do all of that. Yeah. I mean, actually, my, my I, I've got a couple of degrees. My first degree was in business. So I've always right. been interested in, in business, actually. Um, and I do like, whenever there's a new book about regarding management theory or leadership skills, or yeah. I, I, I do like listening to that stuff. Um, but like um, like Elise was saying, the most important thing is showing up and actually doing it yourself. There's no point having all this theory. You learn, like I learned way more in the first week of being self-employed than I did in a four-year business degree. Because yeah. when, when, it's, when it's your real company, like, oh, that's why cash flow is important. Oh, that's why budgeting is important. That's why forecasting is important. That's why I have to understand HR legalities, you know, yeah. like, because it, it's really real. So um, yeah, I agree. It's just showing up. But also, being open-minded i mean when i was growing my my core business i was looking at other fitness companies and i didn't really like their business models i didn't i didn't really resonate with them so i started looking at other industries and uh, so i kind of adopted some practices from other from companies from other industries mm -hmm. and kind of adopted them into my own kind of brand in terms of my business model and that's worked out really well so i think keeping an open mind and you know don't just limit to whatever industry you're in i think that will be helpful yeah, I think that's all really, really useful. Like you said, actually being, you know, having a plan. I know obviously some of you said you didn't have a business plan, whatever, but actually also being able to adapt and, you know, see what the most important thing is you need to do today. What's the, you know, and really working mm. on that and learning through, I guess, self-imposed time restrictions, as opposed to spending three months reading a book about something. It's like, well, I need to get this figured out this week. Now is the time to, 
you know, well, it's, that fail, it's that kind of fail quickly thing, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. like anyone who's done anything has probably failed a lot of times. Be it an, an athlete has failed. You know, someone's really strong at bench press. They probably failed at doing their five rep max more than your eye. And that's yeah. why they're so strong. You know, same with businesses, Elon Musk or whoever. People yeah. who are really amazing running businesses, they've tried lots of things and they've failed and they've learned from it and they've quickly adapted. It's yeah. not just that they're talented. That's yeah. a myth. They just they just worked hard and they haven't they haven't let their ego get in the way. Amazing. Again, more great advice. And I think there's also so many different things you need to learn from a business anyway. You know, like there are there are many different moving parts. You know, like you said, whether it's uh, admin stuff or whether it's growth stuff or whether it's uh, you know management skills or anything. You know, I've been listening to this Audible by Ben Horowitz, the investor from the US. Uh, it's called uh, What You Do Is Who You Are, and it's all about building company culture. Really great, mm-hmm. worth picking up. But, you know, a bit like I just want to jump on that point you said about learning from other industries. You know, he talks about with it with industry leaders. He talks about people who were like, you know, the first black imp- uh, manager at McDonald's and how he kind of went through. But, you know, the culture there, he talks to this guy who basically was running a prison gang in South America and then managed to get out and actually now managed to change the entire culture of his gang to actually be you know, positive in the world and now goes around the world speaking and just a really great audio book, but actually gets you thinking from a new perspective. And again, you know, how to build culture in your company. Uh, but, you know, like you pick these up because they're interesting, but if you committed to reading that, who knows? But, but, like, like, but like Elisa say, but like Elisa said earlier, you still got to do it. There's no point yeah. just having theory. The most important thing is actually being practical rather than being, because yeah. running a business isn't an intellectual thing. I don't think I see it more of a practical thing. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is there's another book, I'll, I'll, I'll link to it obviously on this episode, but it's called um, Create or Hate. And again, it's literally kind of like, you know, we as human beings consume too much. What you need to do is get the balance right between consuming and action as well. You know, we can all sit here and read books for 40 hours a week, but actually, you know, if you can maybe read it for five hours and put the rest into to action, that's what happens. Yeah. That's what makes things happen as well. So, you know, we could all be intellectuals sitting around discussing stuff, but actually it's more about kind of getting on with the work as well. Yeah. Right. You'd be pleased to know we're now coming through into our rapid fire round as we kind of wrap up this great episode. So this is kind of where we go in. I don't feel like you have to give very quick answers, but, you know, it's called rapid fire round for a reason. So feel free to, to give some understanding of this. So I'm interested to know, and I'm going to pick you out here. So um, Elise, say I bumped into you in three years time. Where would you like your business to be then? So I would like it to obviously be continuing to grow, but my favorite thing that I'm doing right now is helping other local people open their own small businesses. So fixed was I opened it with a partner and I helped her open this business. So in three years, hopefully you'll see me opening other businesses with people and helping these people make that jump to open their own business. Yeah. Brilliant. And hopefully I'll bump into you before three years, but it's always good to know to kind of get to that. So (laughs) Carly yourself, where would you like to see yourself and business in three years time? Yeah, I hope in three years time that um, <clears throat> kind of our my goal is to be the best personal training uh, studio in the city. Um, and we have some room to develop and like increase our business size. So in three years, that would be, you know, those two ca- might go hand in hand. So that's kind of the goal. Amazing. And how about yourself, Dan? Where do you see it in three years? Or is it more of a natural thing you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, I still have goals, you know. <laughs> I, yeah. I definitely want to maintain maintain our, our reputation we've, we've built over the years in London as like one of the kind of the go-to personal training teams. So I want to maintain that because that's important for us. But also during the lockdown, I, I set up another business uh, called the Academy, which is training up trainers, mentoring. Um, and also I, I write qualifications uh, and I, I've just finished writing a strength and conditioning qualification, um, which is launching in a couple of weeks. I want that to be successful so um when i try and create things i want them to be long term so i hope the the academy it becomes a success but you know yeah. like, i guess we'll see well brilliant but <laughs> you you've got to put it out there to see if it is let's let's hope yeah. it is. <laughs> we'll see yeah there are some details i'll subscribe <laughs> um and also the next question is which is which is you know you can use one two or three words but if you could use those words to describe what it's actually like to run your own business what would it be? Let, let's go in the same order again, at least. Like, how would you describe what it is in a few words about what it really feels like to run your own business? Oh, good question. Um, I would say, I would just say you have to be gritty. 
I feel like it always comes down to grit with me. Yeah, grit. That's a good word. We haven't had that yet on the show, so I'm pleased that we've got a new word today. How about yourself, Carly? Uh, challenging and fulfilling. Challenging and fulfilling. Nice bit of yin and yang there as well. I like that. <laughs> and Dan? Uh, exciting. Exciting. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. Um, next question. Let's go back around the room a different way. So Dan, we'll start with you on this one. Um, as an entrepreneur, what does success ultimately mean to you? I wish you asked me last. <laughs> um, <laughs> the heart. It's a really interesting question. I mean, one, I don't define myself as an entrepreneur for a start. I never have. Um, I'm, I'm just a fitness coach. You got a bit lucky. But um, success. I guess it's a John Lennon thing. It's like life is what happens. It's, it's basically doing what you want to do. When you wake up in the morning, you kind of, and you go to bed at night and in between morning and night, you kind of do what you want to do. For me, yeah. that's success. It's not about money. It's not about fame. It's not about getting a blue tick. You know, yeah. it's about doing what you want to do. So, so yeah. being in control of your own destiny kind of thing. Yeah, right. yeah. Being, having freedom to make your own mistakes or fail or succeed. Having the freedom. That's what yeah. success is to me anyway. Okay. Carly, with always being in the middle, you have the bonus of not going first or last. So, Carly, how, <laughs> how would you define success? Um, I feel like success in business is having a good reputation, a good brand. Um, I take, I make sure our Google rating is stays stays healthy. Yeah. Um, but it's also it's also important that um, myself and my team can make a a good living. It's no, there's no point to run a business if you can't turn a profit so that's also part of success of course and, and like you said I think you've all touched on this you know because you all are responsible for for other people's lives as well you know not only does that add an extra layer of pressure but you also want to you know look out for people as well you're building relationships with these people and they have lives as well so yeah that's, that's a really good answer and and Elise how would you define success as well as an entrepreneur well, first, I need to say, Dan, you got to give yourself some credit. You keep saying you're not like a businessman or an entrepreneur, but oh, I, feel like, you, I feel like you got it. I feel, yeah, I but, feel that's, like, but yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. So I've kind of stumbled yeah. my way into being relatively successful as a business owner. But I'm, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. That's what my passion is. You know, I just that, that's my that's my thing. And it's just kind of spread out a little bit. We need to get a blue. You guys. Yeah. We, we need to He's get him a blue tick. Mine. Yeah, there's a <laughs> yeah. blue tick on your way. Um, That's what it is. Yeah. Then I can start yeah, selling like, protein shakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there you go. <laughs> I'm like, don't let him fool you. He's got a good business mind. Um, yeah. But yeah, success for me is being able to just like lead the life like that I want. Wake up every day, have it be different, have it be creative, have it be something that lights me up um, and be able to make money doing it. So right now, success is being able to run these businesses also be with my son as much as I want um and have fun doing it and help people so amazing that's so great nice. to hear yeah and it sounds like you are all got the balance right as well in terms wait of a some... second Johnny how about you you're putting us on the spot how about you well do you know what I mean like I enjoy my life do you know what? so you know <laughs> I get to success for me is being able to kind of like do, you know, I, I've worked for many startups over the years. Startups is very transient life. You know, you could be somewhere for a year, two years, three years, four years. And, um, you know, I've started my own businesses in the past. You know, I just like being fulfilled in what I do every day. And I like variety as well. So to put me on the spot, I love variety. It's why I'm doing this podcast now. It's like why I love mm -hmm. chatting with people from all different parts of the world on this podcast. It, you know, it gives me something to do. And then, Later on, I'll be doing two hours of other different types of work as well in a completely different area. So a bit, you know, my attention span is low, to be honest, guys. Like I like to be able to be stimulated all the time with with variety. So I think, yeah, variety every day. And again, being able to enjoy what I do every day. It's why I love startup culture as well. Good answer. So, yeah. Wow. I love this. This is it. You know, you can be me next week. I'll be on as well. Um, final question, you guys would be pleased to know. Um so please, where can we find you online? And is there anything you'd like to, you know, say as a final kind of like word, you know, anywhere you'd like to point people towards anything new that you have coming out soon you know, anything, you know, any closing remarks, you know, tell people where they can find you online and, and also anything that you just really want to get off your chest as well. Elise, maybe we'll start with you. 
Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram. Uh, my personal Instagram is Elise Kyra. So it's weird. It's E L I S E and then C A I R A. Um, and then sweat fix with two X's and then fixed with two X's. Um, and then you can just find us our website, sweatfix.com or fixstudios.com. Um, we have a new launch strength and conditioning program you can do with us at sweat fix, or if you want to take a virtual class with us. You can just book that right on our website and come hang out with us. Amazing. Sounds good to me. And uh, next time I'm in that part of the world, I will do. So sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Carly, how about yourself? Um, yeah, my personal Instagram is carly.ar, K-A-R-L-Y dot A-R. And then uh, the business Instagram is Urban Athlete Calgary or on the website, urbanathletecalgary.com. Um, and yeah, if you want to take a class with me, I teach a glute class Wednesdays, 5 p.m. Mountain Time. So that's where you will find me if you're not in Calgary. <laughs> Very good. Sounds good to me. We'll set our clocks to that. Uh, how about yourself, Dan? Uh, I guess I'm going to, I mean, you know, it's Google me if you want to find out more, but I guess I'm going to mention my new podcast, which is related to business. It's called The Business School. And I interview uh, business owners in, and famous trainers and people in the coaching space uh, just to pick their brain, a bit like you're doing, regarding, um, you know, being successful and, you know, doing what you want to do. So that's called The Business School. And it's on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube. Brilliant. And we'll link to all these as well on our blog. You know, when we obviously, when this goes live, we always link to these as well. So everybody will be able to get access to it as well. So that just leaves me to say thank you to all of our guests today. Uh, Dan, Carly, Elise, it's been amazing to have you here. I really appreciate you giving up your time. Uh, there's been so many great takeaways for, I think, entrepreneurs in the fitness space, but also entrepreneurs wider as well from here. So it seems like you're all getting a really, you know, good deal out of what you're doing with your lives. You're really enjoying it all. Uh, and it's amazing. So good luck uh, for the future in your businesses. Keep winning. And uh, until next time, see you later, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Thank you.